All right, thanks, Paul. Um, so I guess without further ado, I might start. I'm just gonna hide this. Uh, there's a little thing that I wanna hide, hide video panel, hide floating, there you go. Uh, thanks, so um, hi everyone. Today, I'll be talking to you about uh, some recent work from our group uh, called Counter Diabetic Optimized Local Driving. Uh, so I'm going to be covering this paper, which Paul has already sort of seen a short version of uh, in January. And I'll also um, leave a bit of time at the end to talk about some new work that we haven't put out anywhere yet, but we are hoping to have it on the archive in the next month or two. So I think it's it's very related to this uh, counter diabetic um, paper that I'm going to talk uh, talk about today. So I figured it might be a nice segue. So this talk will be in two parts, one big one and then sort of uh, a second one attached to the end uh, sort of to watch out for. So. Um, I've thrown some QR codes around. Usually these are for uh, whatever the link is underneath. So if you want to check out the main paper, the PRX, uh, the QR code is there. Feel free to go there. Um, but primarily the uh, counter diabetic paper that I'll be talking about first uh, was joint work with um, Andrew Daly and Callum Duncan from Strathclyde. So my supervisor, Andrew, and uh, postdoc in the group, Callum, uh, along with Anatoly Polkovnikov from Boston University. And then the second paper, which uh, I'll sort of throw in as well, uh, that was primarily um, work done by Ewan Lawrence, uh, along with Sebastian Schmidt and Peter Curtin, um, as well as Callum and myself. Um, so without further ado, let's move on. Ooh, let's see if, yes, this works now, great. Uh, so with part one, counter diabetic optimized local driving, uh, and I'll start off, I guess this is an annealing um, sort of people who work in annealing, so this won't come as uh, any surprise to you, but I always like to start with the slides just to get everyone on board, which is uh, to talk about what an adiabatic process is. Um, so in essence, what we have is we start with some Hamiltonian that depends on some parameter lambda, and this lambda varies in time. This can be anything. This can be a magnetic field. This can be some external uh, field of some sort, microwave, doesn't really matter. You have some controllability over this, and you vary it from some initial to some final uh, value. And uh, the general gist of adiabatic processes or annealing, I guess, in, in this sense, is you start in the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, uh, which is easy to prepare. And then you want to perform an evolution that stays within that eigenstate uh, and to end up at the Hamiltonian for the final value of lambda within that eigenstate. So assuming you do this process slowly enough, uh, by which I mean you have an adiabatic evolution, you should stay within the eigenstate for all values of lambda throughout this evolution. Um, and so obviously, as you all know, this, this is very useful for many reasons. You have your, your annealing, you have your state preparation gate synthesis. Adiabatic processes in general are quite, quite useful throughout the quantum technologies and quantum computing. Now, obviously, the problem generally is that if you want to do an adiabatic evolution, in principle, adiabaticity kind of demands infinitely slow evolution. Uh, you can go very close, you know, you can go very, very slowly and kind of, you know, um, approximate this as adiabatic. But in principle, you can't have real adiabatic evolution. You'll only ever have some approximation of it because if you drive too fast, uh, you don't have adiabatic evolution, you leave the eigenstate. And if you drive too slowly, then other sources of noise uh, tend to take over. So these transitions out of the eigenstate don't matter in terms of you get decoherence and other things you don't care about. So there is this competition between losses and how slowly you can drive. Um, I also throw in this, um, this slide uh, occasionally. I've, I've had this in because some people don't necessarily work in many body physics or, or uh, deal with quantum simulation or adiabatic evolution. Um, so to explain why I like adiabatic quantum computing or annealing is that it's just very simple. Assuming you have a Hamiltonian that encodes some interesting problem, uh, you don't need to do the whole shtick of translating it to a quantum algorithm and, and so on and so forth. So I made this meme. I wanted to include it here. Uh, that's pretty much the point of this. Uh, but yeah, so what is the point of this talk? Well, what we want to do is speed things up. So what do we want? We want adiabatic dynamics. When do we want them? Uh, we want them as quickly as possible, but we don't want those losses or transitions I talked about. We don't want to leave the eigenstate. So we're going to do this by combining two sort of broad sets of methods from two big fields, shortcuts to adiabaticity and optimal control. Uh, I've added some broad reviews uh, at the bottom there if you're interested. More precisely from this shortcut stadium, we're going to be talking about something called 
local counter diabetic driving, uh, or what we've called it that in the original paper. I think it's called variational uh, counter diabetic driving, but this was just um, made more sense in our world. And we're going to combine these things into something called counter diabetic optimized local driving, or cold for short. Uh, so the reason it's a bit of a mouthful, but you can compress it. And I'm just going to be referring to it as cold for the rest of the talk. So that's the basic idea. So I'm going to illustrate this protocol uh, and go through all of the components of it as I, as I you know, go through each point. So starting off, you have some adiabatic protocol, right? We said we want to do this. We want to start in an eigenstate. We want to end in the same eigenstate while varying lambda. Uh, we need to do this slowly. So how do we speed it up? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a control pulse. Uh, this is the optimal control methods component. Now, in case you're not familiar, I think I, I imagine many people are, but if you're not, the broad idea of optimal control in quantum systems is very simple, which is you have some controllability of your system. There's some control pulse, some operator with some time-dependent coefficient that you can apply to your system that you can vary with high precision. Hopefully with high precision, a lot of Optimal control actually deals with constraints on what you can and cannot do with your system. But the idea is you have this control pulse and you have generally some access to your system, say some measurements you can perform, and then it's just optimization of this pulse with respect to symmetric in mind. So whether it's final state fidelity, whether it's the minimization of the energy, that's, that's basically the idea. So this control pulse is just some set of operators parameterized by some time dependent fields, you know, so here uh, in my picture, these betas uh, is just some parameters that you can vary that describe your, your pulse. All right, so you've got this now. Now, the second thing you do is you add in uh, this local counter diabetic driving ANSATS, and I'm going to explain in detail what this means. Uh, first, by going into what counter diabetic driving is. Again, if you already know about this, I apologize, but uh, it's always good to, to just go through the whole story. So um, the basic idea is that uh, if you have a sort of a changing Hamiltonian, a time dependent Hamiltonian, you can always transform into its uh, time, like sort of moving frame, the lab frames so you can kind of see as this is a gauge. And you can do this with some unitary U, which depends on lambda or on time. And in this moving frame, what you find is if you solve the Schrodinger equation for this state, uh, so this state psi, I can't point right now, but uh, this, this transformed state psi tilde, the Schrodinger equation actually comes out as uh, this state evolves not under this transformed Hamiltonian, not under just the diagonal Hamiltonian moving frame, but under something that has these two components. It has this diagonal component, which would should, in in principle, keep your state in the you know uh, in the eigenstate that it's supposed to. All the eigenstates stay um, without leaving. Um, but there's this extra component with this adiabatic gauge potential uh, in it that leads to transitions out of the eigenstate. This is this is just what comes out in solving the Schrodinger equation. So uh, basically, what the what you want to do in with some with counter diabetic driving is you want to just just cancel out this additional term. So you want to stay diagonal. You want your evolution to always be under a diagonal Hamiltonian. So you add in an extra pulse or an extra drive or something, uh, some set of operators uh, that's proportional to this uh, non-adiabatic term, this adiabatic gauge potential, which you see is proportional to the speed at which you're changing. This lambda dot is just the velocity at which you're changing the parameters of your system, right? So you should technically, if you do this perfectly, you cancel everything out. Now, uh, you've seen this sort of this hand carrying the tray on the side. Um, I always like to go through this example, which I think is very intuitive for understanding what kind of diabetic driving is, which is imagine you're a waiter and you're carrying a glass uh, from the bar to a table. And uh, you want to carry this glass as fast as possible because your customer is waiting and, you know, you, you don't want to just be a snail along. Um, and so what you do is you start accelerating uh, through the bar to get to the table. And that induces these sort of fictitious forces on the glass, makes it wobble around, makes it move. So your instinct is then to tilt the tray in order to counteract whatever these fictitious forces are uh, in whichever direction that you need to turn. Right. And this is precisely what counter diabetic driving is doing, which is if you accelerate a system, it induces these instabilities and a counter diabetic drive is simply something that counteracts these um, these instabilities throughout the process of actually moving your system. 
So that's Canada back driving. Now, the local version that we implement in our methods is, um, uh, is kind of based on the idea. It came about due to the fact that in practice, uh, deriving this counter diabetic drive for any system of interest, almost any system, unless it's something incredibly simple like two spins or one spin, um, is actually very difficult. And even if you manage to do it, the um, it's it's so complex that actually implementing it gets very hard. So the way I like to show this is that you know this adiabatic gauge potential is is proportional to this term, which you know you need to know the entire eigenspectrum of your system at each point in time. It's a very difficult problem. Not only that, but it can be delocalized through the entire system. So you know you can imagine that for a single spin, this might be just you know a single Pauli operator. Uh, for two spins, you now have to include you know all possible two Pauli operators, and these are all imaginary for reasons I'll explain in a bit. Um, and say you now have three spins, well, you're going to have to include all the possible three body terms and so on and so forth. This thing can get very big and very unwieldy. And so in practice, this counter diabetic drive is not easy to understand or to drive or even to implement once you, assuming you've actually got a perfect model of what it's supposed to be. So local counter diabetic driving was um, the solution by Dries Sells and Anatoly Polkovnikov, who's on our paper as well. Um, to sort of how to, we need to find an approximate version of this counter diabetic drive. So uh, you can kind of take uh, inspiration from the waiter and uh, understand that the waiter doesn't really know how each molecule of water moves in the glass as, as they're walking. Uh, instead, they sort of apply like a general, you know, high level approximation of, you know, keeping the glass as stable as possible. So this is the same idea as this LCD which is you choose some ansatz operator basis. So you kind of have some degrees of freedom that you can vary out of this full adiabatic gauge potential. And then you perform some minimization, which I won't go into the details of because it's a lot of math that I don't think is worth going into. You can look at the paper if you're interested. You perform minimization. And then what you find is you find the actual form of the drive for this set of ansatz operators. So uh, again, I like to work with spin systems because it's easy. So you can imagine the first order spin system, you might have your ansatz be a set of local uh, Y Paulis, and then you would have some time dependent coefficients before each of these, and you find what these coefficients, what the form of these drives are by this minimization procedure. So for each set of ans, you know, for each ansatz set of operators, you can find exactly what these, uh, what these gammas or zetas are. Um, and you basically have, the local counter diabetic drive to this approximation, which is great because these are generally implementable. You know, you can choose what operators you can implement. Say you're an experimentalist, you're like, I want to apply counter diabetic drive, but I can't do the full thing, but I can do local Pauli wise. Great. I'll just find, you know, to what, what the pulse should be for just these local Pauli wise. So that's kind of the idea behind the LCD. Um, so what we're doing here is basically by including it into this protocol is we're going, well, uh, you already have a controllable Hamiltonian, and then you add an approximate counter diabetic drive, uh, which, you know, you know, you can also control quite well because you've presumably picked a set of operators that you can actually work with for both the control pulse and for the local counter diabetic drive. And you see how this LCD actually has a dependence on the parameters of the optimal control. So what we're basically doing is we're saying the counter diabetic drive depends on the path your system takes, the path it takes from lambda zero to lambda final. So what we're allowing it to do is if the approximation for the counter diabetic drive is not very efficient, if it's not very good for the original, you know, H of lambda that you had, because you are approximating it, you're only taking a component of the full thing, just some operators, subset of operators, then what we're going to do is we're going to build a new path in parameter space with this optimal control component that will make this approximation of the counter diabetic drive far more effective. So we're just combining the two and hoping that that leads to better results. And then what you do is you optimize these parameters beta in a way that leads to, you know, whether it's best final state fidelity or, you know, you check how, how much you've stayed in the eigenstate. Uh, and that's kind of the idea of code. It's a very simple idea. It just has a lot of these components. So um, I like to go through a couple of results just to illustrate that it works. This is the one I'll stay the most on because it's the simplest and I think it's easy to understand. This is just two spin annealing. 
the reason this is nice is because we know the full counter diabetic drive for this, which is just first and second order, the way I call them, because you have local single spin terms and then you have two spin terms. And assuming that you've uh, derived the counter diabetic drive for all of these, you've got the full one. So on the left side, uh, what you have at the bottom is just the speed with which you're driving. So on the left hand side, you're driving fast, right hand side, you're driving slower. And you can kind of see how, uh, so the, the dark triangles, the no counter diabetic drive, you get really poor final state fidelities uh, for short driving times. And these get better as, as the driving time increases. And this is just, you know, you, you approach adiabaticity, no magic there. Now, then when you apply just the first order local counter diabetic drive, you already get really good fidelities, but they're not units uh, at short driving times. It's a little bit below unit fidelity. If you apply the full counter diabetic, you're basically at, at you know, one fidelity, no matter how fast you drive throughout this, uh, this entire regime. So assuming you have the full counter diabetic drive, you can just cancel out all of these um, transformations of, of the eigenstate, all of these losses. Now, on the right hand side, uh, we've got an application of just optimal control. So I've included these local Z's. Um, my control field is just some parameterized function uh, with local Z operators. So you can see that it performs better than just the bare, you know, H of lambda, but it's not that much better. It's still quite crap at short driving times. But then what we do is we apply cold and cold here. I, I didn't write this down. I really should uh, only has first order LCD. So it only has these local sigma Y's and it has a control field with local sigma Z's. So these are both quite easy to implement. These are things that anyone can do. And you can see that it doesn't need the second order to go to just about unit fidelity at arbitrary driving times, at sort of very short driving times. So that kind of shows you very clearly, I think, what the effect is, and then it's better than either optimal control or local, like the first order local. Uh, and so to give you a few more examples of what we've done, these are just a few from the paper. Uh, we've uh, seen what the phase transition on the Ising chain might look like with this model. Again, uh, this BPO is just uh, optimal control. You see that there's this dip where it performs quite well at some time, and this is just a natural sort of time scale of the system. But in general, at very short times, this cold method tends to perform a lot better than either just the local counter diabetic drive or the optimal control on its own, which is kind of the goal. We want to go as, as quickly as possible. We want to drive as fast as possible. Uh, and we, we also did this by constraining the amplitudes of the drives because a lot of these things uh, tend to you know, request a lot more power at shorter driving time. For, for reasons that I think are physically intuitive. You can ask me about this later. Uh, but we've constrained the drives to be of the order of the largest term, the original Hamiltonian, and still cold outperforms optimal control uh, in this case. And then at the bottom, so that's the right hand uh, sort of larger plot. And then at the bottom, you just see that these things scale well with system size. And in our case, and, and sub K was just the number of parameters that we had to optimize. And for the drive we had, one parameter was enough basically to get this kind of advantage. The more interesting example was preparing GHZ states uh, on frustrated spins. And um, this was interesting because we wanted to see what generating entanglement might look like when we apply this method. And what we found was essentially that you needed uh, first and second order local counter by driving to achieve a noticeable, like valuable, basically fidelity, like a noticeable speed up. Um, if you didn't have, if you didn't include second order, so two body terms basically here. So first, but one body terms were just not enough in the LCD, you needed two body terms in order to efficiently generate entanglement at fast uh, driving time. So um, if you wanna ask me about what corners in global mean, you can, it's basically just uh, whether we apply a global sort of the same drive on all of the spins, or if we differentiate between the spins and the corners, the yellow, red, and the ones in the middle, um, sort of taking experimental considerations in mind. Um, so yeah, that was interesting because it tells you something about non-adiabaticity in uh, entanglement generation, these kinds of systems as well, which tells you that you need non-local uh, counter diabetic terms that there's a the non adiabaticity is non local in, in like first order. So that was quite interesting to find. Um, 
and yeah, uh, this is sort of it for this part, really. I've, I've gone through the methods. And uh, if you want to find out more, I wrote a more extensive sort of blog post, which is written in simpler terms and covers most of the background that I've spoken about here. And obviously, if you want to check out the paper, there it is once again. Um, feel free to access and talk to me about it. Um, and then I'll go quite, I think, quite quickly, hopefully, through the second part. Uh, let me see how much time I have left. That's good. Um, this is a paper that's not out yet. This is a work in progress. The title is a work in progress, but um, this is basically a follow up we had after cold, which was, hey, computing these this minimization process for the LCD is generally quite complicated and uh, intensive and we didn't like it. So we wanted to find sort of efficient ways to compute and understand this AGP and this, this counter I bank drive. Um, as well as exploring it on um, uh, icing graphs and so on. Sorry, what, was everything? What, what, what is the AGP? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, so I was going to, yes, the AGP, okay, the cool. adiabatic gauge potential. I apologize. Yes, I should have put that in the, in the main thing. Uh, but yes, so so this is what the adiabatic gauge potential is. It was just this term, the second term, this these non-adiabatic uh, effects in your Hamiltonian that just come out when you have time evolution. So uh, the adiabatic gauge potential is very interesting quantity uh even after a year of, of studying things around it i don't think i fully understand it. it it contains a lot of information mostly it's used as a way to classify non-adiabatic effects in the system but people have used it to talk about quantum chaos uh some people have made statements about uh finding quantum phase transitions using this uh the norm of this adiabatic gauge potential uh which we kind of question because we find that it's not it, it's, it's sort of non-analytic at phase transit or rather it spikes uh, during quantum phase transitions, the norm of this thing, but uh, it spikes at other times as well. So I don't know if I can make that claim. Um, and yes, and also quantum uh, approximate optimization algorithm schedules also seem to be informed by this adiabatic gauge potential. It, it has a lot of cool, cool information in it. So we'd like to be able to compute it. We'd like to be able to understand it. Uh, that's kind of the motivation behind uh, the second work. So we've already seen this LCD, right? You, oh, sorry. You need to choose some ANSATS operators and perform nice minimization. Now, the problem with that is you need to choose a set of ANSATS operators. These can be informed by the physics. Uh, so you saw that most of the ones I've shown you were imaginary operators like sigma y and, and combinations of sigma y and sigma z and so on. Uh, this is informed by the fact that once you have a real Hamiltonian, you can kind of very easily see in, in how you derive this thing that, that you should have an imaginary um, AGP. Uh, but otherwise, there's not much information, especially to higher orders, about which operators matter, which ones go to zero, and you know what this thing actually looks like. So you're kind of blindly choosing the signs at, which isn't great. So the nice thing is that very soon after this LCD paper came out, um, a new sort of approach um, oh, by some, some of the same authors uh, was found to be this nested commutator approach, where you basically just... Uh, do odd uh, sets of nested commutation. When, when I say odd is every second commutation leads to some order of this AGP. So uh, commutation between the Hamiltonian and its derivative. So first order will be just the Hamiltonian's derivative. Then you do another commutation of that with the Hamiltonian. Another one, you get some second order operators. And again, you can just take these operators, perform the minimization and so on. So this is nice because it gives you some idea of what these operators should be and what the form of the AGP is, but this actual approach is not fantastic either because it's not guaranteed to converge uh, unless you go to infinity, which, uh, and you get some of, the, some of these actual operators keep coming back on each other. They're sort of like self-correcting. Uh, you get this back action as you keep doing these commutators. So it's also not, it's a much more elegant approach, but it's still not perfect. So, what we decided to do very early on before this paper even started, uh, I just, it wasn't in the cold paper because by that point we'd done most of the calculations, was to um, find the operators using this uh, nested commutator approach and then use minimization just for the, you know, without any of the structure from this nested commutator, use minimization to find the driving pulses. So um, there's a bit more details here, but that's a very simple explanation of what happened. And then we decided to do this numerically because that's kind of what a lot of my group does. And um, it turns out this minimization process, this optimization to find these alpha Ks uh, and doing the nested commutators, obviously for larger systems is very computationally expensive. It's very annoying. 
Uh, so we decided, hey, is there any nice mathematical structure or, or any symmetry that we can exploit uh, to, you know, to kind of do this without all the complex numerics? And I'll give you a quick overview of the idea. So this new paper, you know, we have a bunch of stuff in it that we're trying to put together into a nice narrative, which, you know, we have a recursive method basically to compute these nested commutators, which is very efficient, and very nice. And uh, we've sort of made this optimization also sort of taking a couple of seconds to get a couple of hundred of these operators out and, and, and to derive what these, um, these pulses, these uh, LCD pulses should be. And then we also explore what this means for many body systems, uh, specifically for Ising graphs. So you, where um, each of your spins is sort of a vertex on the graph and then their uh, couplings are the edges, right? So you can build all sorts of different graphs with different uh, strengths of interactions between, not strengths, sorry, just different um, um, couplings between them basically. And uh, this graph on the right is like, it's a very rough graph sort of showing you how many of these spin operators you need uh, to cover the full adiabatic gauge potential for each different type of graph. So the simplest is the ring because there's a lot of nice symmetry there. So you need far fewer of these operators to get your non-adiabatic effects basically. Uh, then there's the fully connected graph, uh, which starts out sort of simpler and then uh, sort of surpasses what is the chain, which is just a chain of atoms. Uh, up to the more, most complex, so you see these dots sort of go to this near exponential regime. This is where you get highly non-symmetric graphs and um, things where you have like a triangle connected to a chain where each of the spins is non-unique. You can't really exchange them or, you know, most of them are non-unique. So this, this is related to these non-adiabatic effects. So it's quite interesting to study. Um, whether or not this is interesting, uh, very quickly, we explored some of these graph properties to see how connectivity of, of many body systems affects non-adiabatic non effects. So to some order of this AGP approximation to like five body terms, six body terms here for six spins, um, we checked how these um, so the sum of the lengths, so how connected all of the spins are to each other, uh, how this affects what the final fidelity you can get for some order of AGP is, and so on and so forth. So we were trying to explore like basically what different types of many body systems, how much would these, how complicated would these adiabatic gauge potentials be? If you're interested in this, feel free to ask me or read the paper, but I kind of want to flag it up that this is something we explored and it's actually really interesting. Um, and yeah, there's uh, kind of at the end of the day, want to flag up that while we're doing this, uh, just like a month ago, these two papers came out one after the other. I think one was a panic published uh, of exploring, trying to find these AGPs basically using Krylov space and uh, Langtros, uh, Langtros algorithm methods. So both these archives came out like a few days apart. And these are, turns out that our collaborators in Boston were actually finding the exact same results at the exact same time. They have something else to do, so it's fine. But uh, there are like three groups working on this at the exact same time all at once. Uh, and then there's this other paper from Fizreve, which uh, makes some questionable remarks, but they have their own nice algebraic approach to computing this AGP. So there's a lot of work in the field just coming out in recent years. Uh, we're definitely not the only ones working on this. Um, but yeah, I think I'll finish here. I think I've taken my, yes, exactly as long as I wanted. Um, so yes, cold, new method for speeding up adiabatic processes. Uh, and I didn't really say this throughout, but this was very much developed with the idea of, you know, applying it in practice in experimental settings. There are other papers combining optimal control and counter diabetic driving, but a lot of them are very niche and sort of very specific to the systems that they're dealing with. Uh, ours is very general. You can basically pick a system, pick your operators, see what you can do with it. Um, and then obviously we have the second thing coming out on numerical and analytic methods for computing adiabatic gauge potentials, which then inform counter diabetic drives or other optimal control approaches. You don't need to even apply the counter diabetic drive. You can just take the information from this AGP and apply it. Um, and yeah, there's just lots of things to explore. It's actually a very, very open field with a lot of things yet to, to be seen. So uh, thank you very much. And that's me, that's me done. Uh, good, thank you very much, Eva. Very nice presentation. A uh, little round of applause on behalf of uh, the audience. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to open this up for questions. So does anybody have any questions for Eva? Either raise your hand or just unmute and speak up. No. Uh, 
Hi, uh, so thanks for the very nice talk. Mm, I have a question on the first part. Uh, can you summarize the main difference between your cold approach and original proposal by Paul Kovnikov? Uh, so the proposal, the LCD, you mean? Yes. This local, yes. Uh, so in the local Canada Back Drive, they don't choose, um, they don't particularly care what path you take from your initial Hamiltonian to the final one. They mm -hmm. just pick some schedule, you know, some lambda, some okay. function of lambda, and then they find what for that what the counterdiabatic drive is. So what we say is, uh, you can change what this path is, right? Mm -hmm. And you can change this path knowing that you will apply some approximation of the counterdiabatic drive. And we see that for some paths it's actually much better. Like if you only, if you can only apply some approximation, only very local terms, then you need to choose what your path will be very, very carefully. Okay, but then uh, the optimal control is, uh, let's say, on the standard uh, annealing uh, driving and not on the uh, approximated counter part. It's, it's, it's both. We sort of apply both. So in our optimization, we apply both the optimal control and the counter diabetic drive, and then you see what leads to the best results. That's pretty Yeah, much but it. the schedule that you optimize is the one mm -hmm. that multiplies the standard it's just, driving. It's just the control. Yeah, we only optimize the control because, okay. the, yeah, so the, the control then informs the counter diabetic drive. So we, we change only this, but that affects what the LCD will okay. be. But so then you like iterate this procedure until you get convergence. So you yes, your... yeah. okay. Yeah. So convergence or the, sometimes the landscape for these things is complicated. So we're just looking for the, the best sort of we do multiple optimizations. We say this in the paper and see what's what's best. Um, there's uh, I didn't there's some work in there. I didn't actually mention it because it's a bit open at the end of the paper, but you don't even need to do this is a cool thing, which we don't know how much you can push. You don't need to do a uh, wave function. You don't need access to the wave function. You don't need to do this evolution. Mm -hmm. You can sometimes just minimize higher orders of this AGP, and that leads to really good schedules. Uh, and that's just minimizing a very simple function. So that's like a very nice idea, but we need to explore that a bit further, I think. So ways of optimizing these things, yeah. Okay. And a second question. If Go ahead, uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, so can you do this optimization with information that you can realistically get in experiments? Or... Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. I'm, I'm assuming that you, you have some metric like final state fidelity that you can actually check or some operator that you can measure, right? That's, that's the general case with optimal control. Mm -hmm. is, is that you assume that there's some closed loop optimization okay. that you can do with your so system. So for instance, measuring the final energy would be enough. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Any other questions from the audience? So uh, maybe I could ask a question. Um, you, you had a slide uh, uh, in the first half again of your presentation where you're looking at the two spin example, which was nicely mm -hmm. political. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so the control field um, is just uh, sigma z. Um, it's, it's, is, it's is that, is that yeah. something? Is that something you've chosen, or is it optimized, or, or or what's the story there? So a lot of a lot of the paper was basically going what we we speak to experimentalists. What do they want? <laughs> I'll be honest, like it was very much like, uh, so we have a Rydberg atoms experiment here at Strathclyde. And so that's why the Ising chain made a lot of sense. And that's why Sigma Z's made a lot of sense. These are just the easiest things to control. And we wanted to understood. make it. So, so yeah. you're not saying that Sigma Z is necessarily optimal, but it's what you Yeah, have it's not. It's, okay, understood. It might not be. And you can play around. That's the thing, it's, it's, it's a sandbox. I think we picked the things that seem the most realistic. But obviously, if you have a system where you have, you know, cooler operators, more controllability, then that's yeah. sure, sure, understood. Any other questions for Ieva? Well, if not, let's thank Ieva again for a very nice uh, seminar. Thank you, Ieva, uh, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing everyone at the. Uh, Next Inca seminar, which is at uh, 4 p.m. UTC uh, next uh, Tuesday, April the 4th. So uh, until then, thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.